Well, let's take a look at the climate indicators. Not a whole lot of change. We don't expect rapid changes with climate indexes, but the Matt and Julian oscillation has shifted to phase two. What is phase two? Well, this time of year, not a whole lot. Cool in the Great Lakes, maybe wet in Florida. But during the summer, it can be a strong indicator of hot weather in California. But those correlations are not always very strong. Anyway, let's take a look at that surface map. Well, yet again, we've got a frontal system from the Gulf Coast region back into the southwestern U.S. This looks like a carbon copy of Wednesday. In fact, let me show you that map. Yep. Groundhog Day. I don't know if you remember that movie from the 90s, but it almost seems like that. We're looking yet again at a possibility for severe weather around Waco and just west of there. So, very strange, but we do have a flow of cold air coming down out of the northern plains, some gusty north winds back there, and further to the southwest, some snow and grapple around Santa Fe. Let's take a look at the northeastern U.S. We've got this little wave moving through Ohio and Kentucky. Out ahead of it, a large band of precip moving into the Lake Erie region, Pennsylvania, and the Delmarva. Let's take a quick look at the radar. And there it is, quite extensive. Looks like some of it is clearing the Washington, D.C. area, but Philadelphia, State College, and New York City, the weather is going to go downhill. Temperatures in this region are in the 50s, so not expecting any wintry weather. There's a look at the surface plots, a very stout onshore flow in New Jersey down towards Maryland. And if we pan to the south, yeah, there's definitely some evidence of a low pressure area. The lowest pressure, about 29.78 around Richmond. And just a little bit of weak bear clinicity, some warm temperatures in the southern quadrant. So you could probably put a front somewhere in here. I might go like that with the cold front. And the warm front would be just to the southeast like that. And now that we've taken a look at that small scale structure, I would probably correct that chart, put a low pressure area right there, the warm front to the southeast, and the cold front would connect back into Georgia. In the southeastern U.S., storms going once again around Miami. We can see that the flow has turned westerly. However, some areas around Palm Beach getting heavy rain once again on top of already saturated ground. We are expecting an increase in precipitation as this weather system and associated upper level wave swings southeast into the Gulf Coast region. We'll take a look at the charts for a closer look at that shortly. In the south central U.S., we've got an enhanced risk today from SPC for severe weather. And there's a look at that enhanced risk from Dallas all the way down towards College Station, Austin, San Antonio, Laredo, and just barely grazing Del Rio. On the surface chart, there definitely is evidence of cyclonic circulation between Brownwood and Brady. So I would put that low right there. The warm front extends about like this to just north of College Station. That would be around Norman G, out towards Huntsville, and down south of Jasper, and then the cold front. That's going to come around towards Ozona, south of Fort Stockton. You can see the much colder temperatures to the northwest. And it does look like we have a dry line, and that's going to extend from around Brady, down towards Mason, and out towards the hill country, maybe just north of Del Rio. So that's the setup for today probably a secondary boundary up through here, and we'll take a look at the satellite in just a little bit. But let's cover the rest of the U.S. first. As we mentioned, that cold air is flowing south. We've got frost advisories for north-central Kansas and much of central Nebraska. And then moving into the southwestern U.S., we mentioned that snow around the Santa Fe area. Red flag warnings down to the south with that increased wind and very low relative humidities. And we are looking for some heat in California today. That cold front is not quite pushing past the Sierra Nevadas, so we are going to get a rapid warm-up. 
And there's the temperatures we're expecting for today, lots of 80s and 90s. We're expecting 93 at Sacramento, 96 at Bakersfield, 94 at Ukiah. And you can see up in the Pacific Northwest, also quite warm, 88 degrees at Portland and 78 at Seattle. And all of these red temperatures will be breaking records for the date. And the heavier red color there at Portland that indicates that they're breaking the record by a fairly large margin. The all-time record for April is 90 degrees, so we are coming close to that. So hopefully this is not a preview of what's coming up for early summer. You probably remember, what was it, uh, one or two years ago, they had that 120 degrees up in British Columbia, 110s there. I really hope we don't get back into that pattern once again. Up there in Alaska, continued cold, still seeing that northerly flow, this time flowing into a low in the Bering Sea region. Some rain moving up into southeastern Alaska once again. The town of Sitka, which is somewhere down here, they broke their record yesterday for rainfall with 1.18 inches of rain, and that broke the old record set in 1964. Taking a look at northern Canada, a very gradual warm-up. You can see temperatures are starting to rise up near 30 degrees up there along the Arctic Ocean coast. Some of those 20s moving into Victoria Island. However, the northern parts of the Canadian High Arctic still quite cold. Still looking at sub-zero conditions up there around Ellamere Island. Then heading back down south, mild conditions in the Canadian prairies. Some strong downslope there in Alberta. Temperatures coming up to 50 degrees there with northwest winds. And then looking out there in the eastern part of Canada, Mild conditions with 50s and probably going to be seeing 60s out there in the Maritimes, New Brunswick, later this afternoon. So, returning to that enhanced risk, what is the first product we should look at to assess the situation? Well, if you've guessed satellite pictures, you're correct. Now, I'm not going to say that there's a right or wrong way to do this, but this is a logical first step because you can see everything going on. You don't miss any precipitation. You can see where the air masses are, and you can see that we're already dealing with very early initiation. So that's what's happening right now. Since we have initiation, it's a good idea to go ahead and put on the counties. And if you're not familiar with the counties, there's the interstates. So we're definitely looking at just west of Waco. That's going to be around uh, San Saba, maybe just to the north of there. Let's break this down. Well, we've got practice from Wednesday. Pretty much the exact same setup. Cold air coming down south. Don't have as much cold air up in this region in northeast Texas, so that may allow some of the activity to build north. And we have the extensive tropical air flowing north. That does not look quite as plentiful as what we had on Wednesday so that will work somewhat against the storms. And then we have the dry slot out here. The dry line, of course, is somewhere in the middle of all that. Now, since this area right here is part of the tropical air, I would expect to see stratus there, but that's not the case. And that does hint at the moisture problems that we are encountering today. Here's a look at the one kilometer winds up at about 3,000 feet or so. I have a ice attack scale up here to show the wind speeds and the forecast is not using that because we've got a weakness in the low level flow. So basically no low level jet. The only jet that we're seeing is in the wake of the cold front. That's a cold air advection jet and that will strengthen overnight a little bit, but overall the tropical sector are looking pretty weak. And here's the moisture and wind at 0.5 kilometers, just a narrow wedge along and slightly east of Interstate 35. So most of the severe weather should be concentrated right along that axis. And we can take a look at the high resolution rapid refresh. We'll take a quick proximity sounding ahead of this complex. And there we go. We do say that there is enough shear, just barely enough for a tornado risk. This is not as high as what I saw back on Wednesday. There is some dry air aloft. The moisture does taper as we go up to higher levels, but still there's about four or 5,000 feet of moisture. 
but with this dry air and instability, decapes are running up near 1200, which is fairly high. And this indicates outflow dominance. This indicates a little bit of trouble with the inflow organization. I'm sure we will have some severe storms, some supercells, but this does kind of tip things in the favor of an MCS. So I'm going to be looking for that as we get into late afternoon and into the evening. And here's a little graphic showing the initiation right there. That's what's going on right now. The color scheme here is theta E, and that's directly what provides a line on the skew T over to the right. So the higher the theta E, the more we can pull that line over to the right, the greater the instability. So this kind of reflects the moisture axis and to a certain extent, some of the warm air out to the west. And as we go forward into, into the afternoon, you can see that the MCS impinges on that theta E axis right around Temple and Georgetown. So that's probably gonna be the key area we're gonna focus on for today. Looks like later in the afternoon, really not the theta E's are not that great out east. So that may help East Texas. So probably the best chance of severe weather is gonna be right there along Interstate 35 and possibly working down south during the evening, especially on the tail end cells. And then as we get into evening, I think maybe some of the activity should subside and it will become more of a forced MCS complex. On the backside though, we can see some convection continuing into the overnight hours. So maybe a little bit showery out there in parts of East Texas, Western Arkansas and Southeastern Oklahoma. And we'll go ahead and break it down at the national scale. We can see that MCS developing in Texas, a large area of cold air advection just to the north, and you can see that high pressure out around Midland. Anyway, that will continue developing overnight. This is gonna be about midnight. Lots of showers into Arkansas and a little bit more of a string bean shower area from Missouri up to the Great Lakes. And that precipitation area in the Northeast will continue pushing into the New York City and upstate New York region. Going into tomorrow morning, most of the MCS pushes offshore into the Gulf. It will be cloudy and kind of showery around parts of Arkansas, East Texas. Meanwhile, showers continue up in the Northeastern US Another region of showers develops out in Minnesota and Iowa. That's gonna be cold core activity. That, that is basically inferred by the thermal troughing that we see there on the thickness lines. That's gonna be those red lines. And you can see kind of a broken character to the clouds, which are indicated in gray. Then going into tomorrow night and Sunday, we get an MCS moving into Florida, sweeping through during the early overnight hours Saturday into Sunday and then into the day on Sunday. So that'll be approaching Miami, Palm Beach during peak heating on Sunday, up to the north showery around the Great Lakes area. So kind of a dismal weekend and another area of cold convection out over the northwestern region of the U.S. And that'll push right down into the California Valley and give them a bit of a cool down as we go into the first day of May. Okay, so I'm going to have to go ahead and wrap this up. Let me give you a quick update on the radar. I want to try to get this out even earlier than I did back on Wednesday. We see a kind of disorganized area of storms that's going to be from Comanche down to Goldthwaite. Let's run the animation on that. So that just popped up in the past 20 or 25 minutes, but that is continuing to push to the east. And that cell there does have a decent chance of becoming severe. But like I said, I'm not seeing any indicators that are off the scales for tornado activity. However, strong winds and large hail are definitely a possibility throughout much of central Texas. And here's a quick look at CB WAFs. This is one of the best mesoscale models we have right now. And this is the track of the highest updraft helicity, the best chance of supercells. So it is focused more on the area between Temple and Waco. And we can see that that's up in the north part of that county right there, severe thunderstorm warning was just issued. 
So we're talking about that region right there, so I would probably adjust that just a little bit further to the south, maybe towards Kyle and whatever town is in here, the north part of Fort Hood, and possibly all the way down towards uh, about Franklin, Texas, later during the afternoon. Anyway, that'll bear watching. Let's look at the hail. Probability of one inch hail, pretty much following that convective complex and developing further south as that complex back builds into the hill country. And here's the reflectivity paintballs. It looks like it verified a little bit further south than what's shown here. So the actual storms are located right here. So you want to adjust that as you use this output. And you can see how it develops. Basically a big MCS forms around that initial cell and more activity up to the north around Dallas and Fort Worth. But you can see there's less of a coherent picture of where things are going to form. But the instability up in that region is a little bit weaker. There's the most unstable cape, so it definitely is weaker up in the Dallas area. And you can see the storms feeding off that little plume of moisture right there down towards Palestine and Crockett towards dark. And as I prepare to render and upload this, things are evolving pretty quickly. Southwest of Hamilton, looks like we have a tornadic cell right there. Definite supercell structure. You can see the inflow notch right there. And going over to the velocity, we are getting some very strong shear. That's almost certainly a TVS. So I'm going to put a dot right there. That's going to be 44 in and about 52 out. So that's 100 knots of gate gate shear. Not a whole lot of correlation at the higher tilts. And then on the next frame, it does seem to track a little bit to the east-northeast. That's going to be it right there, kind of in this region. And if we go over to the reflectivity, you can see that's right there in that hook. Now, typically, as these cells evolve, they start tracking more to the southeast. That's typically what they do when they take on deviant right motion. So hopefully that will take Waco out of the gun. They had all those problems back on Wednesday. Hopefully not a repeat of that. But this could spell trouble for Temple and Belton, Killeen, Gatesville. If you're in that area, keep a close eye on the weather watches and warnings. And we can see the complex filling back in to the southwest. So the air mass is not really all that capped. And we should see that evolve into a large MCS as the afternoon goes on. So anyway, I've got to get this out the door. I do want to announce our new weather map handbook, fourth edition, extensive revisions. That's now available at weathergraphics.com slash map book. So head on over there if you want to get in line for a copy. Those should start shipping in about one to two weeks. So I hope you have a great weekend, and we'll see you back here on Monday for the supporters and on Wednesday for everybody else. Take care, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.